It's time to get back to Curtis Wright on the beat on 106.7 My Talker Radio. Well, you know, the old saying is if you don't know where you've been, then you certainly don't know where you're going. And it's important to understand our history. It's titled the CFO Act 25 Years Later. And give me a second here. I just want to read you a couple sentences of the introduction to this article. Our democratic form of government derives its greatest strengths from an informed citizenry with the freedom of speech provided by our Constitution. That strength, however, depends on elected officials and their appointees operating and exercising financial management control over the business of the government and providing accurate financial and other reports to the people. It goes on, of course, to detail his vision uh, and his belief in the standards and the practices we should be putting in place at the federal level for a federal government to do just what he says there in the first and opening sentences of his new article. The CFO Act, 25 years later, with us is former congressman and founder of truthingovernment.org. Of course, that's Joe Diaguardi. Good morning, Joe. Good morning, and why me to write this article? Guess what? I came to Congress in 1985 from a great accounting firm, Arthur Anderson, spent 22 years there, worked on the bailout of New York City in 1975, worked on the first prototype of an accurate, accrual basis financial statement for the U.S. government in 1976, and then decided after 22 years, you know what? I think we need me inside Congress. Everybody thought I was nuts. Never ran for anything except homeowners, president of my homeowners association. <laughs> and it succeeded. So I came there with the idea that we needed someone with fixed responsibility for financial management, financial reporting in the executive branch, because we had all these characters in the uh, uh, legislative branch. We had the Controller General, you got the Congressional Budget Office. Hey, this was the act that I introduced in 1986. Two more times in 18, 1987. Why? Every two years, if it doesn't pass, you've got to put it in again. So I put it in twice, once in March of 87 with 10 sponsors, and then I got real hot, and guess what I did? I became my own staffer. I went on the House floor in between votes, had my manila folder under my arm, and got 57 members on both sides of the aisle to understand it and to sign on, and that bill became the bill after it went to the Senate with Senator Glenn, that was signed by President Bush in 1990. It's 25 years later, my friend, and they've asked me, the Association of Government Accountants, would I write an article? Am I happy with it? What do I see as the current condition of this act, and uh, what are the changes that I thought had to be made? And I said, I'll do it only if you make the theme of the next annual conference of the AGA, don't forget I spoke at their last one in Orlando, and it went very well on the issue of accrual accounting. And they said, All right, we haven't decided yet, but write the article. If that article moves the people here at the AGA, we'll put it in our quarterly journal like we did your article on accrual accounting last year. It'll come out in the spring, and hopefully that'll spur the people responsible for theming this uh, annual convention in July of 2015 to make this the theme of the act. And, Joe, you'll be invited back as a speaker. So I'm planning ahead. Unlike yeah. the federal <laughs> government, I plan ahead. Well, it's, uh, I'm looking at the uh, the actual uh, copy of the original uh, article that uh, was done on you by Stephen Collins. And, it's uh, of course, it's 25 years ago, I guess. And, and it, it, you know, here, here's what the article opens up with. A man with a vision bringing modern management skills into the federal government. So th this battle goes on and on and on and on, oh. and it's pretty simple, right? We should run the federal government exactly the way we run other businesses, other operations, but for some reason, that wouldn't politically, I guess, be beneficial. But is it too simple? It should sim be simple. I know. It should be black and white, it, but it's like racism in America. It's complicated. People have conflicts of interest like grand juries when they bring cops before them. Yeah. There's so much that has to be resolved in this country in order to make it truly democratic, whether it's social justice, criminal justice, whether it's the numbers. It's hard to believe. And what's Congress doing? Nothing. Nothing. They're trying to figure out who's going to be the next president. Let's, uh, let me, let me, is it too simplistic to ask? Let's go through the CFO Act 25 years later 
and give me the maybe the top three or four positives and then the the things that looking looking at it have not really happened or are evolved the way that you wanted them to okay well first you know that the controller general of the united states of america he's the head could be a she later but it is right now it's a he the head of the general uh, it used to be called the general accounting office they changed it now to the government accountability office that's okay uh, he's probably <laughs> is, that a, is that an oxymoron no okay go ahead I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it could be it's like truth in government everybody calls me truth in government where'd you get that that sounds like an oxymoron <laughs> So, uh, but it's, uh, it, back then it was Charles Bowser, Chuck Bowser, a partner of mine from Arthur Anderson that left in the late 70s when he was working on this stuff. I was kind of a peripheral partner to the team that he was a more major player because he was an audit partner. I was a tax partner. But the point is that he went under a program of early retirement for public service, but he was over 50. I was only 43. So they had to change the program for me to run. They thought I was crazy, but I pulled it off. The point is, that is probably, he is, that position, GAO, and that organization is probably the most respected, quote, independent. It's not independent, though, although even their audit report says it's the independent audit report from the GAO. Why? Because it's a government agency auditing a government agency. That's like the Ethics Committee of Congress, where other congressmen, your colleagues, are, you know, judges, prosecutors, and, and, and you name it, to another member. That is in conflict. You need outside, and I put in a bill for that. And by the way, I was so persuasive on that issue, guess who I got to sponsor it with me? My last bill before I left in 1988. You wouldn't believe it. Barney Frank. <laughs> you can't get two people, and he did it at a time when his speaker, Mr. Wright, was under attack for ethics violations, having sold a book to unions and put it in all kinds of nonsense. The point is, you know, I've been at the edge on many things, and Congress is moving very slowly. It's almost like you've got to measure Congress in geological time, <laughs> not, not human time, because they don't change things. But here's the Comptroller General back then, after I started talking about it. Here's Chuck Bowser. I'm going to just quote it. It's in the article. There is no official with clearly defined authority and responsibility for assuring the effective and efficient operation of the federal government's accounting and other financial management systems. Clearly, the original concept of, trying, of tying management improvement to the budget just hasn't worked. So, and then he said it's time to establish a chief financial officer. So he was agreeing with me early on, 1985, 86. That article you're reading is the American Institute of CPA saying, God, look at this guy. He came to Congress. He's a freshman. Uh, uh, he's a minority member, a junior member of the minority party, and he's already coming up th with these great ideas. Well, that kind of spurred me on to then really get aggressive and start, you know, explaining why we needed this. But guess what? I was at the right place at the right time, Curtis. Why? 1987, the SNL crisis. Right. Everybody was pissed off at the fact that we had to come up with $500 billion off budget to bail out the SNLs, and they didn't even do that the right way. They left a lot of zombies there so that, you know, lawyers who have a lot of lobbying power could get more fees before this thing was finally done in. You know, now looking back, what, what do you look at and say, well, we need to— uh we need to do, uh, you know, we need to uh, move further or things that were watered down that you felt that, you know, really weren't truly enacted the way they were envisioned. Yeah, I, I boiled it down to three important things that I put in the conclusion to keep it simple. Before I mentioned SNL, we got to be careful with these acronyms for people who don't remember that. That's the savings and loan crisis of 1987. That provided the opportunity for me to get some traction because members were concerned that they were being beat up left and right. How do we let this thing go? Or how come we didn't know about it? You now want $500 billion. You want to put it off the budget. So that became the impetus of cover your behind. And what do we do? Let's get that bill that Joe DiAguardi put out and make it look like we're being financially responsible. That was the prime motivation. It wasn't to do something good for America. It's all political. That's what I learned. But before I get to those three, just quickly, that interview that resulted in, a, uh, in the article you saw by Collins, I repeated something I said early on in a Republican Party caucus. And this is it. And you'll understand this as a former businessman, executive. 
quote, waste isn't one thing. It is thousands of small things. It is structured, systemic, and must be approached from the point of view of financial management, good accounting systems, and strategic planning. Why was that important? I was trying to prepare my house colleagues as I walked around the floor for the need for a chief financial officer, a concept that could only be implemented for the federal government through legislation. And that legislation I put in for the first time, March 25th, 1986. Now, for the three big items that I felt could start to cure the problem, and I hope I can make this point loud and clear at that conference when it comes up. The first thing is, what is a chief financial officer? You, you know, and that's a CFO, by the way, and mm-hmm. I, we mentioned CFO. I just want to be sure people know. Many, many, every huge entity needs someone with fixed responsibility when you run the financial affairs of either a publicly traded corporation or any large entity. Certainly, a governmental entity is among the largest, especially when you're talking about the federal government. Now, you know, the first thing that I said in my whole preamble to the act that was passed was that if we don't change the accounting systems and get the right numbers, even with a great chief financial officer, he is not going to have the database he needs to figure out where we're going. So I said that we need to prepare annual reports, which we're doing today. And by the way, they're only doing it today because the 1990 Act had as one of its provisions that it's now mandatory for every department and agency to prepare an annual report. The reports, though, with my original Act, were supposed to be on generally accepted accounting principles, which means the accrual basis of accounting. And that's the accounting system prescribed by the accounting profession and called for by every controller general, four U.S. presidents since 1949, and two Hoover commissions. So what happens? I'm out of Congress at the time. I leave in 88. 89, it's in the Senate. By 1990, it gets passed. Somehow, the politicians got to work and said it's a good idea. But you know what? We don't need generally accepted accounting principles. That, that, we don't know what that's going to mean for us. It may make us look really bad because we're not putting everything on the books. Right. So they changed it to accepted, acceptable accounting principles and formed something called the FASAB, the Federal Accounting Standards Advisory Board that almost makes you feel like it's like the FASB in the private sector. It's not. <laughs> I'm not going to get into that. The point is, so they come up with now acceptable or accepted accounting principles, and they redefine what generally accepted accounting principles should be for the federal government. There was no need to do that, Curtis. We have the SEC enforcing the right accounting principles for publicly traded corporations to protect the shareholders of those companies. Why can't we do the same with everything else? So number one, let's go back to the original language, uh, generally accepted accounting principles. Number two, we need a chief financial officer that is independent of the system. Now, we don't want it to be someone from one of the big accounting firms that's too independent until we get to the audits. But we want someone who we feel is not compromised with conflicts. Now, we have a person like that already. That person is the Comptroller General, but he is in the legislative branch. And guess what? You can't fire him. You can only impeach him. He has a 15-year term. It could be a she someday. Mm -hmm. And that means that his term is not coterminous with any political official being elected. So he's completely outside the purview of politics in Washington. I want to see a person like that called a chief financial officer in the executive office of the president, where he has, you know, the professional competency and integrity, and it's an independent position within the executive office of the president, and a 15-year term, equivalent to that of the controller general. It's, again, checks and balances. This is too important not to have someone of that stature responsible for financial management, accounting systems, and even financial reporting. I, that is the person that's got to lobby Congress mm-hmm. to say, hey, you've got to change these accounting principles. They're not working for me or anybody else. So it's got to be totally independent. It's not. The chief financial officer, and my bill had that. Guess what they did? They put it in OMB three levels down. So he's equivalent to an assistant secretary for financial management. Mm. This is not right. Third, 
Why not have independent audits? Don't give me this nonsense when I read the report put out, and it's going to come out pretty soon for the fiscal year 2014. This is an independent audit. No, it's signed by the Comptroller General and the Secretary of the Treasury. That is not independent in the real world. That is a government agency, you know, giving some credibility to another government agency. They don't have enough credibility to do that. So the audits should be by non-government, independent, private sector, certified public accountants to remove even the perception, you know that word perception, yes. that the annual financial statements are in some way uh, not compromised by government agencies auditing other government agencies. And I, that's where I and went. You know, and so you I, know, Joe, one of the things that we've seen, I've spoke to uh, George Rage about this, uh, being a retired member of the New York Stock Exchange, something that's been unprecedented during this president's term is when we've had outside independent uh, organizations that have always, uh, always uh, the environment has been you don't touch them, you don't influence them, you don't, uh, you know, you don't try to uh, interfere with what they are uh, are analyzing. And I'm talking about Moody's, right. I'm talking about S&P. We've right. seen unprecedented in the history of the United States, a president and an administration that when these people report something that the administration doesn't like, the truth, about right. the financial condition of the federal government, they then are the target of lawsuits. Right. You know, and that's, that's the way things work in Washington. The political system wants to control everything. Why? Their existence depends on good news to the people right. who are not that well informed. So when you get to an election, you want to be sure the numbers are under your control, pretty much, and other things that you should not have control over because you want to and be able I to sell that. the perception not yes. the reality exactly well it's both i think but perception definitely has to be also i mean if you want credibility you you you, you can't have the people thinking that something is wrong it's like what's going on now with the racial situation there's a perception there now if you got into all the facts you might find that it's not exactly as is being put forth right. in the press but the perception is so bad the, the entire system now has to be dealt with. Joe, thanks for being with us as always. And we're going to put this up on our websites. And folks, don't forget to go to truthingovernment.org as well. And all that we talk about, all that Joe writes about and presents is all there. Thanks, Joe. You have a great week. We'll talk to you next you week. You too.